Now, we're going to start discussing what is his major work. So this is what Descartes is known for more than anything else is his Meditations on First Philosophy, um, a, a brilliant work, one that is, is influential even today, one that every student of philosophy has to read. Now, I will say when you read this book, I tend to, at least to find it pretty readable. Uh, I think Descartes is quite a good writer. You can really follow his train of thought much better than a lot of the philosophers following Descartes. Uh, philosophy seems to get a little more obscure the further it, it goes, but Descartes, I think, is, is a relatively easy read. Now, when I say relatively because we're talking philosophy here, so I, I never say that philosophy is an easy read of really of any kind, but I tend to think that his thought is quite logical and systematic. Even if you don't agree with his conclusions, He's, it's very rigorous in his in his methodology and clear in his presentation. All right, so the the meditations, a few things that I want to say about what's happening in the meditations before I go into this the specific arguments that he makes, uh, where you have the kind, I'm going to outline kind of the kind of shift that you start to have from classical to modern philosophy. Uh, the first point that I want to mention is that Descartes begins with this perspective of, of doubt. He begins with the with an assumption that I need to have a perfect, perfectly reasonable, rational starting point that I can come to kind of by reason alone. Um, but that, that is an indisputable starting point, and this we saw was part of his methodology. Uh, I want to say that though this this idea of doubt and the kind of beginning with doubt about our experience of the natural world is not original with with Descartes. Now, what he does with it is, but he was also influenced by a couple other thinkers as well. And the the most important here is probably uh, Pierre Chaon. And Pierre Chaon is a he's a Jesuit. Uh, he is a he's a theologian. He is a philosopher. He responds. Uh, to John Calvin in particular, and is very critical of the Reformation. So he's a, a prominent defender of the Counter-Reformation in France. Now, there are some some doubts as to the validity of his faith. Some people try to make an argument that he actually was was really just an arch skeptic and kind of used faith as a veneer. I don't necessarily think that that's the case. Of course, I don't know what was in the guy's heart, but um, so so I'm I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but Sharon claims that the existence of God is actually unknowable. And this is something that he says in response to the Protestant Reformation. And in his view, the Protestant reformers had too high of a view of the human intellect. And they believed that reason could discover far more than reason could actually discover about the existence of God, about the meaning of scripture. Because one of the primary debates between the Protestants and Roman Catholics was the question of the perspicuity of Scripture. How clear is Scripture? Can we, by Scripture alone, come to a knowledge of the truth? And in response to the Reformation, some of those in the Counter-Reformation, defending the Counter-Reformation, really starts to degrade what the human mind can actually know. And start to say, well, the human mind can't really know much at all. Reason is very weak. We don't know that much apart from the revelation that is given in the Roman Catholic Church. So this beginning with doubt or the doubting the existence of God was really done by Roman Catholics to try to defend the necessity of the Roman Catholic Church. Because the human mind doesn't really know anything by itself. Instead, we need the church to tell us what to believe. So it's a very odd thing, but you do find this in France. And to be clear, this is not this is not universal among Roman Catholics that they're all making the, these kinds of arguments. But it was pretty common among a lot of French Roman Catholics. So we're talking about the birth of modern philosophy, whereas I, I hear a lot of Roman Catholic polemicists try to blame Martin Luther for skepticism that arises ultimately with modern philosophy, beginning with Descartes. Descartes is influenced by counter-Reformation defenders of Roman Catholicism. And, and that's really what influences his methodology, not the Protestant Reformation. So the the influences on modernity are are varied, and they include certainly the events of the Protestant Reformation because they changed the world significantly. But they also include the responses of the Counter Reformation, and the the so, so here is where with someone like Sharon is really where you see the uh, nominalism being continued. Uh, when you look at the 
figures of who are both Reformed and Lutheran uh, in the Reformation at this time, their major theologians are very devoted to the basic claims of Plato and Aristotle and classical philosophy. It's really here with these French Roman Catholic thinkers that nominalism starts or continues really to, to gain ground and is then used as, for them, proof of the necessity of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, of course, if you reject the necessity of the Roman Catholic Church or the authority claims of the Roman Catholic Church, then what are you left with? Doubt and skepticism, and that's it when you, you are using this system. Um, so I want to point that out to say that's an influence on Descartes. That's very important for Descartes, um, but it's not to say that Descartes just took his entire argument from Charon, but some of his... Uh, his starting points in terms of, of this beginning with doubt and doubting what the human intellect can actually know and the reliability of our sense experience does at least partially come from there. Uh, the second thing that really shifts with uh, Descartes' philosophy from away from classical philosophy is that he begins with the self. And when he's trying to look for this kind of undoubted starting point of, of absolute certainty, he begins with what's going on in the human intellect, in the human head. And so in, you know, in our heads, uh, we, we have, he's, he basically says, we, we start from a, a perspective of internal doubt and we ask, do I exist? Do I know what exists? So instead of coming from a starting point of assuming that what we know of the world is generally reliable, we start in a very inward way. So this does start a shift in, in both philosophy, but also just in how we view ourselves in the modern world uh, into this kind of internality. We, we start to shift away from external things toward internal things in looking in our hearts and looking in our own internal heads to find our own identity and ideas. So some of this shift we can say is Descartes. There are a lot of other factors that go on toward this kind of individualistic internalization of all things that we have in the Western world today. But Descartes is, is at the very least a significant element of that shift. All right, so we have then that shifting to the self. Philosophy begins with the self, and that's not how classical philosophy works. Classical philosophy starts in different places, but uh, it could start with knowledge of God, for example, as, as a first thing, and then we move on uh, from there. Okay, then we also have in philosophy, this is the, the third major thing that happens with Descartes, we have a shift in philosophy away from metaphysics to epistemology. And metaphysics is a question of, of what's real, what exists, what is being. Uh, this is the first things of, of philosophy, the question of what is reality. So that's why you have things, questions about the one and the many, because you're asking like, well, how is reality made up? You know, is it made up of one things or many things, or how did the one and the many things all come together? Or you have the questions of change and constancy. How was there change in the world versus uh, versus consistency in the world? What what thing is reality made up of that makes sense of those two things that we uh, experience? Epistemology then is questions of of the mind. Questions of how do I know anything? How do I know what I know? And in classical philosophy, there is plenty of writing on the question of the mind. So it's in it, and of our knowledge. When I say mind, I'm not really talking about like the structure of the mind or the nature of the soul and relationship between soul and body or soul and spirit and body. Uh, I'm talking about how how knowledge from the external world or from these abstract universals, how they enter into our head and we make sense of things and know what's real and what's not real. That question is something that I think everybody asks. So epistemological questions are just basic human questions. You know, kids ask these questions of like, well, how do I know that's real? How do I know that person's wrong or this thing is right? Or how do I know that this thing exists and this thing doesn't? And, and you know, you have to, as parents, we probably all have kinds of answers that we give to our kids because we all have some concept of epistemology, whether you know the term and or the philosophy or not. We, we all have ways of understanding how to distinguish between what we believe is real and what isn't. So those are questions of, of epistemology. How do we know what we know and how do we doubt what we doubt? And the shift, though, in philosophy now is from metaphysics to epistemology. So in the past, while it was assumed because of the universals, it's assumed that what we generally know in the mind is, re is reliable in terms of how we experience the world. Descartes starts to shift things to the question of, well, how do I know the external world is real at all? 
I can't just assume that, so I can't begin talking about what being is without knowing if anything exists or how, if I can know anything at all. So we start with the questions of epistemology. Now, the questions of epistemology are really going to lead uh, in the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is pr primarily going to be questions of how we know what we know. The, the metaphysical questions that we have in classical philosophy uh, well, I wouldn't say they disappear from philosophy because Descartes, you know, has some things to say regarding metaphysics. Uh, they really take a backseat to a lot of these other questions, really until Hegel comes along in the 19th century. Um, okay, 